no problem. Thanks for uh, uh, picking up. Hey, so, um, yeah, I sent you the email. Basically, the, uh, the, the conversation, the, the topic of this podcast is really um, the meta conversation, you know, how the topic itself has evolved over the last couple of years. Right. And I think no one really has followed it as closely as you. Um, and I think that's because you've left yourself so wide open. And so I think a lot of people might be interested to hear from your perspective. Um, what um, the conversation has changed um, into from when you first started talking about it, where it was like, don't talk about it or, you know, euphemize it to where now it's, you can talk about it um, and have an open conversation now. So, right. Um, yeah. So who's the first celebrity who really dropped the F bomb? Uh, for you, with <laughs> well, the first celebrity probably wasn't the one we we wanted, but in fact, uh, you probably heard me describe it as no one wanted to be the first drunk girl on the dance floor. And yeah, th- so yeah. When, so when the first one happened to be uh, the most likely girl to be drunk on a dance floor, it would have been Tila Tequila. Okay, that's that's see, that's what I thought. Way I thought back, in the first one. which is why it was not even remotely taken seriously when when she started talking about it. I mean, she was famous for being famous. She did a sex tape, uh, you know, just a uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even call her a B or a, a C actor. I mean, she, you know, she was a reality show actress, and uh, so she was the first person to bring it up. But the fact that but she brought it up, it was it was good for. Again, any publicity is good publicity, right? Unless, right, unless right. we start blowing up post offices and stuff like that. But when she came out and did that, it was an interesting novelty piece for the media to latch on to. Sort of like one of those, oh, and by the way, if you missed it, <laughs> tequila. Yeah, clickbait. Yeah, it, it was good. Yeah, it was good. And then, yeah, the radio host could pick it up. So, yeah, exactly. I thought when something like that happens, it's not necessarily bl- uh, bad publicity because that's when they let the Trojan horse in. Right. Is what I think. Right. So she she got her foot in the door, and then the next one was the next one would have been Bob, which so okay. so at the beginning of so okay so I did the clues the beginning of 2015. She did her thing, I believe, at the end towards end of summer. Someone will have to look that up. Uh, but it, but towards the end of 2015, and then at the beginning of 2016 was when Bob did his thing. And right. Okay. And B.O.B. was the one that I thought was progress because that's when you had the pop scientists come out and challenge him. It was the rap battle, right? Yeah. And it was really interesting how it happened. And again, if you believe everything for a reason, B.O.B. released a song called Flatline, part of his album series. In fact, he used a domed flat earth model for the cover of his album, that particular album. And he made a song called Flatline. And the reason why Neil deGrasse Tyson came out against it was he, Neil, or I'm sorry, B.O.B. used like, oh God, it was like 45 seconds or more of Neil's famous clip where he was addressing some university students. And I don't know the university for the life of me, where he was telling people that it, the earth wasn't a sphere, it was an oblate spheroid, and it was actually pear-shaped. And Bob spliced that into a, a section of that song. And then he made it, took a couple shots with the lyrics, saying that uh, 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 Neil Di- Neil Tyson needs to loosen up his vest. That man's probably getting one hell of a check. And he never released a video nice. for it, which is for obvious reasons. And I did. I I, I did a, a cool little slideshow for that and and interspliced all the things I think he would put in. And Neil's nephew, who was a budding rapper himself. And, you know, all all rappers are budding rappers. He, right. <laughs> he, came, he came out. He, he convinced Neil to help him release like a response song. And it was called, ah, crap. I can't remember what it was called. It wasn't in anywhere near as catchy. And because of that, the rap community jumped on this. So that was a, it was, in fact, for a couple of days, it was a big thing. And I remember, uh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt any time if I'm going off into the no, tour. that's. That's about the time that I picked up. So, oh, okay. yeah, that's about the time I started paying attention when Neil dropped the mic. And yep. so I- yeah, yeah, there was no reason for Neil to respond the way he did. In fact, most of your scientific community would have never, ever touched this thing with a 10 foot pole. So, when Neil went on Comedy Central and did that seven minute monologue where he was just up there in a black t shirt, and then he ends it with, This is gravity, and drops the mic on the floor and walks out. 
that was the beginning of a whole bunch of memes and it really helped fuel the flat earth community uh, right see that's why i call it a trojan horse it's like they let it in because it's clickbait and they think it's a gift They're like oh this is a gift it's going to bring us ad revenue and it's going to give us fodder for talk shows mm -hmm. and they don't realize that the idea within it is actually kind of uh subversive in a few ways but with neil degrasse tyson going on these these talk shows the reason i think it's kind of conspicuous though is Colbert you know he's he was given his own little ISS patch for his work in reaching out to the youth with the space program's message uh. and so yeah so I'm like it's kind of interesting how these celebrities are pretty um, comfortable or pretty um, close to astronauts and NASA and right. you know they make friends and it's, it's a celebrity thing oh yeah so, yeah absolutely yeah. NASA, NASA has been established for well what, 50 years and they have been, you know, they're the, I, I, I don't necessarily want to call them the face of science, but they're the most high profile organization wing of science. And because of that, and, and they, they're, they're smiley. Out of all the military groups, you know, of course, celebrities will do things for, for, the, for the servicemen. They, and they've been doing these for every war since we've had wars. But, but that's only during times of war and when we got things happening. Celebrities can interact with NASA all the time. Because they wear white uniforms, they don't carry guns, they smile for the camera, and literally, they, there's really no mention in the mainstream media of NASA being military. And so, celebrities, it's a safe move. You know, it, again, you can't think think of a, a more benign guest you can have on your show, or you go to visit someone than NASA. It's like, oh, NASA, it's shiny and friendly, and it's the future, and we make movies about it. And so, yeah, the media loves, always has loved NASA. And it's, it's now after so after the Neil, you had the Kyrie Irving thing, so, and that's where I think it got a little more interesting because now it's like it's dangerous to them because now somebody who's seen as cool is actually right, talking about it, right? A different demographic, although still sort of urban in a way. Because so Kyrie, so the the Neil Neil Bob thing fueled most of 2016, and then. In 2017, literally, I mean, almost a year ago to the day, the uh, the All Star Game was coming up, and Kyrie Irving, during a podcast similar to this one, was on a plane traveling to the All Star Game, and he just and his his um, uh, friend Richard Jefferson baited him on on the podcast and 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 knew that Kyrie might bite on this, and he did, and he goes, yeah, absolutely. There's flat blah blah blah, and goes into his spiel. And what made it, what the reason why it was such a huge shot in the arm for us was that most of your athletic interviews, as you know, are super boring. Athletes, as a rule, are, are about one of the most conditioned groups there are, you know, because they're, they're you know, sports, 24-7, sport 24-7. So when you interview them, it's like, yeah, the defense played great and offense played, you know, 110%, blah, blah, blah. It's all about coaching, so and so on. And... So when he landed for the All-Star game, literally within 12 hours of media day, what, what do you think the media is going to do? They were all over him because it's like, finally somebody in, in the sports community says something that's remotely interesting. Not not who they're right. dating or anything like that. It's like, oh, yeah, Kyrie Irving, by the way, in the All-Star game, one of the best basketball players in the world, he believes in flat earth. And it was it was monstrous. And then... For a brief moment, Shaquille O'Neal got on it with him. Right, right, and both okay, both Shaquille O'Neal and Kyrie Irving in have both been. It seems to me it's almost like they're called to task. They're called to account for it to um, the late night talk show host Jimmy Kimmel. Yep. So he bring he brought on first he brought he first he brought Shaquille Kyrie, Shaquille first right. Yep. And he basically says you don't really mean it right. And I'm right. like. That looks like damage control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was his opening line. I mean, out of all the things that you're going to ask this guy, and Shaquille's been on that show before, and he goes, yeah, his opening line was, you don't really believe in flat earth. You know, like, like nodding at him, like, follow the script. You don't really believe in it. And honestly, I was amazed that Shaquille held out for as long as he did. I think he lasted a week, 10 days, because people forget that even though Shaquille hasn't played for years you know he's still considered one of the, the the best basketball players of all time he makes 20 million dollars a year in endorsements i mean huge endorsements and all yeah you know if his agent got one or two calls where you know the somebody's saying so this flatter thing's not real right 
you know, he, he had to backpedal. It was a question of, of millions. He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to. I mean, it wouldn't have ended up like Tiger Woods where people are just abandoning him. But they just didn't. You know, the corporations have a pull. He signs contracts saying that, look, if we're going to endorse you, you can't go off the rails. And even though Flat right. Earth isn't really off the rails, it's not like, you know, he's running naked through the streets on meth. It's it's still riding a fine line. So yeah, so Shaquille had to, had to backpedal. Yeah, to me it's just business. I can understand that it's, yeah. it's business. It's like um, if you're wearing a, a uniform for any company, there are only so many things you can say because you're representing it. And so I could see why it would be problematic. But no, he stuck out pretty long. And and I think that what what made um what made his particular argument for it kind of um, interesting is he was just like it looks flat. Like he was he wasn't even making any. He wasn't saying. Go watch Eric DeBay or watch. No, the video. no, he, he was wasn't. He was going off to observations, and then Charles Barkley was on a podcast, and he was asked about it, and he said, "Oh yeah, I was listening to um to our friend talking about flat Earth, and he looked at the moon, and then he looked at you know he looked straight ahead, and he said, no, there's no way that the moon is that far away. It's not two hundred thirty thousand miles away. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, it's not like he's just dropping it out there because he's told to. It's almost like he's actually just asking questions from observation. Right. And I think that's what I find interesting about it is when they're not really endorsing any particular content creator. They're just talking about their own observation. Same with Kyrie. Right. Kyrie's whole take on it has been think for yourself. Right. And, yeah, and I was really surprised that Kyrie wouldn't eventually defer to somebody. Uh, you, like B.O.B. eventually, uh, just I think three months ago, he finally mentioned in a very small clip that he put on YouTube, uh, he mentioned, hey, you know, don't don't just listen to me. Go check out Eric Dubé's stuff. And I was like, all right. And, and I kind of I kind of knew that. But B.O.B. was also in touch with Jaron. Like those two were actually chatting between each other. And they um, there was and that kind of fell apart just briefly. And I, I, I don't think it matters if I say this because Eric told B.O.B. that, that Jaron was like the enemy or one of the enemies, one of the the the, the shills. Right. So yeah, which. Yeah. yeah, we know that. We yeah. know the the, anat the anatomy of the shill. For those who are uh, who didn't follow flat Earth, who don't follow it, it's basically like the way of outgrouping somebody else. It's like they're not authentic enough, or, right. or they're not real enough. They don't have street cred. It's a it's a smear that has no real definition. Which is well, I I had to eventually look it up because it was bugging me because I I heard the name being tossed around so much. It's like, man, I better figure out the origin of this thing. The origin is actually from it's an older term uh, from the word shillaber, which means quite literally, Carney's assistant. And you'll you'll get yeah. this. So when when you're at a carnival, everybody knows what a carny is. You know the guys. Oh, three ring toss. Wear a stuffed bunny for your girlfriend. You know, that whole thing. But a shillaber is the guy on the outside that makes it seem easier than it really is. He's working for the carny. And so he's the guy that'll walk up, say, oh, yeah, holding one of these damn bunnies and saying, oh, yeah, I just want a bunny. It only took me like a dollar to do it. And it's like, oh, OK. And then, you know, $20 later, you haven't gotten your bunny and that guy's gone. That's that's what a, a shill is. It's you know, OK. OK. So it's kind of like they're part of the ruse to make it to, to get people to participate. Exactly. In something. So like if you're ever okay. in the city, like uh, three card Monty, you know, that that stupid game they play in, in the cities where it's like, you know, find the queen, find the queen. And that guy's on the outside and say, oh, I won 20 bucks finding the queen. That's all the shillaber does. Now, how people you know how it goes. You know, people just throw the term around. I I guarantee that 99% of the people that are listening to this do not even know, didn't even know that story, that that's where the origin came from. They just think that shill equals bad guy. Shill equals disinformation agent, which is not, you know, they're, they're different things. Right. So. I, I thought shill came from shilling, and I just figured it was some, like, crowds on demand, like crisis actors. You pay them to make it look like there's more of an interest in something, a rent-a-mob or... You know, I, I, that's kind of what I. Oh thought. yeah, 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 yeah. Like, well, yeah, shilling. So, yeah, it's shilling would be a variation of that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. if there are any shills, they're going to be the the government paid J trig ones who are anonymous in the chat, saying mean things for money, yeah. and they're probably disseminated more among the more standard partisan politics. I don't imagine you're going to find that many real um, disinfo or disruptor agents in flat Earth. I think yeah. that you're going to find them if you're, especially like during 2016, you have like the 50 cent army. You have these uh these basically like cubicle farms full of internet trolls right and yeah they exist they exist but they're not gonna ha well 
yeah, that side topic. But yeah, it, it, I think I wasted a bit of time during the year trying to, um, you know, refute claims. And I realized, you know what, no matter what I say or do, they're going to call me whatever. So. Yeah, it is not going to make any damn difference. I have gotten into discussions uh, via email with, you know, full-blown trolls. And I've given them everything I, I can, and they there there's just isn't enough. There's there's some hate in their heart, and again, you, you've heard me quote it before. Uh, t that's the, I'll use her name this time. Taylor Swift, you know that that line from her song, "Haters gonna hate, 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 hate." That is absolutely spot on. It sounds like a stupid lyric, but it's true. There's nothing you can do to stop them. They will always hate. Doesn't matter what you give them to to try to satisfy their needs. They're they're always going to be there. And uh, right. the the line I like to use is like, look, pick any topic. It doesn't have to be the internet. Although the internet's you know ripe for that's low low hanging fruit. The uh, I'll use movies because I love movies. Doesn't matter who wins Best Picture of the Year guarantee there are reviews out there calling that best picture you know the oscar in hand a piece of crap <laughs> you know, right utter it, crap. yeah exactly it was like it was just I, nominated won 10 academy awards and you think it's a piece of crap yes i do it's like great right well this is why i think it's important to support content creators because you know as a rule like if you're going to go speak in public if you're going to make a, a polarizing comment you know you're going to get a large it's always like um you know, 40% are probably going to agree, 40% disagree. Then you got the middle ground who are waiting to be swayed. But you're not going to have everyone liking you. And so, no. you know, content creators have to have a bit of a thick skin. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, ultimately we, we among those of us who have researched these topics, are probably the least likely to listen to what anybody says. Right. So it's like if you're going to tell me to not listen to this guy, it's like, hey, I'm the guy who decided that the globe doesn't make any sense. So if I'm willing to go that far – on my own, you're not going to steer me anywhere. I think that's right. like, it's like herding cats trying yeah. to tell flat earthers what to think. There's, Good luck. Yeah, there's a, uh, uh, I've seen some like, uh, the, what's the analogy? Sticker shock with people that are into other things that turn into flat earth believers. You know, they have fairly big channels. And when they go flat earth, they're surprised because they've never seen it before. And, and what I try to tell people is like, look, if you go into flat earth, the number of comments in your video section are going to, you know, multiply by a lot. And a lot of them are not going to be fun. And, but you, and you've got to be ready for it. And so many of them aren't. And so, you know, they'll, they'll release a flat earth video. And then three days later, they'll, I, I've seen people back out. I've seen people pull their videos. I've seen people make defensive videos against a perfect example would be, uh, oh boy, red pill philosophy. Red Pill Philosophy, yeah. When he first got into it, I was so happy that he did. You know, he's got, you know, six figures. He gets into it, and all of a sudden, he's he's not backpedaling, but he's digging his heels in and saying, look, idiots, <laughs> stop, you know, be a little more open-minded. I've been teaching you to be open-minded for years now. I throw this out there, and you come at me like I'm a witch. You know, it, it, it happens. And yeah, with, with anyone that creates content, you just got to be ready for it. But yeah, you do have to develop some sort of a thick skin. The, um, the, the line I was going to use was um, everybody, we kind of gloss over all the great comments, all the compliments, and we only focus on the one. It happens with everybody. So it's like, hey, you're great. Hey, you're great. Hey, you know, 10 times, 20 times in a row. And then all of a sudden, you suck. I hate you. Unsubbed. You just dwell on that because it's like well, the the negative. It's the whole politician thing. You you get yeah, it, yeah. it. It hits you harder. You can say you're a great politician all day long, but most of the people on the other side are going to muckrake you because that resonates more with people. I you know they they focus well, on back, it. Back when I had a YouTube channel before, I mean I've been I've lost so many channels that I, for you know YouTube's terms of service are difficult to work with when you're actually being controversial, but right. I would get thumbs up, thumbs down, and at one point I realized the haters or the trolls will bring in 20 sock puppets, and they'll artificially give you more thumbs down than you have. And so at one point I realized they're putting a lot of work into it. That's a lot of engagement, and I look at the analytics, and if I do a five-hour live stream and I'm being hounded by opposition, it actually adds to my bottom line. So my policy was um, – thumbs down to my my subscribers sure. like, let's just weigh it down with thumbs just engage engage and then it buries their influence and then it makes it look like 
I'm getting oh, yeah. um, more approval than I am. It, and then to spite me, they'll give me a thumb up. And I'm like, hey, look, I just got my worst critics to give me thumbs up. Your metrics, the metrics in YouTube, they're really deceiving. Because, uh, in fact, producers told me this as I was being interviewed uh, a couple of years ago, which was they say, look, it, it, from a producer's standpoint, from a, anyone that, that's in media, it doesn't matter whether they love you or they hate you as long as they're talking about you. That's all that matters. Uh, I, I did one of my most brutal interviews with uh, one of Eminem's stations. And uh, this is called Shady 45, you know, from that whole Slim Shady thing. And he, they opened up the phone lines and they came after me like I was the devil himself. And at the end, the producer could not have been happier that that had happened. He goes, I'm so glad you didn't hang up. And he was the one that, that was telling me what, what it's all about. He goes, look, uh, he goes, it does not matter. If they're, if they're yelling at you, you know, they're coming at you. And, and so I sort of, uh, I researched that a little more and it, I, the, the closest version I could come to it was the Jersey Shore, you know, the MTV show, which, you know, you loved it or you hated it. And I tried to focus, I go, look, you know, you remember if you ever watched that show, the Snooky character, right? This, this oh, yeah. Yeah, that horrible <laughs> troll girl, you know, I don't even know. Oh, she was awful. But the point that I even say that, that she, she uh, get, gets that response out of me. She gets massive, you know, she gets still dragged out to things, you know, she's considered a, a celebrity from that standpoint, but it's because she's polarizing. That's and, and right. It's engagement. Engagement counts more than whether they like or love you. It's engagement. And yeah, yeah you do have to weigh the likes versus I mean, you have to recognize that. Yeah, you probably have more supporters than detractors and their opinions should matter more. Right. Because we know for a fact that the people who are objectively analyzing this, they're they're absolutely making decisions based on you know, what you're saying in your content, whereas the haters are just hating. So right. they shouldn't actually count as much anyway. So, which is, um, you know, I think it's, it's a, it was a learning experience for me going through the, the YouTube gauntlet right. and recognizing that ultimately you want that kind of engagement. And I think as a result of all the celebrity interaction, the social cost of talking about this topic has gone way down. Cause I found it really easy, like on, at a barbecue, just saying, Hey, did you guys hear what Shaquille O'Neal said? Right. Or did you, you know, so the cost has gone down socially. Yeah, um, and, and it's it's now it's now in our vocabulary. This is, we've gone past the stage of that it's this absolute fringe talk topic that nobody talks about anymore. It is now into the uh, we can talk about it now. There's still a lot of people that are going to disagree, and there's going to be still a lot of opposition. But the topic is out there. Where it's if beforehand, no, you know, no people hadn't heard that topic in years and years and years. Now it's like, oh, yeah, I just saw it on the Internet last week. In fact, exactly. Um, just before you called, I don't know if you even saw this uh, number one YouTube channel in the world. PewDiePie, he made a video on it, literally called the proof the earth is flat. It's only three hours old as of right now. And, oh, no, I haven't checked it yet. Yeah. Uh, it. And of course, he's sort of, you know, he's poking at it, but not that not as bad as you might think he, he is. And the fact that he titled, I mean, again, the, uh, talk about your, your bang for your buck. He's you know, that's the number one YouTube channel in the world. And he literally made a video called Proof the Earth is Flat. It's brilliant. Uh, you know how much exposure, how much exposure that's going to give us? It's huge. He's got 60, right. 62 million subs, I think, right now. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah I, I have. Um, I mean, I've been studying the publicity of this thing because of um, you know with, with the billboard campaign, and oh, yeah. we saw how how the yeah. how it just opens the conversation to where hey, now we can safely talk about it. And then Mad Mike, Drudge Report, Thanksgiving, <laughs> yep. and so now it's like you, you can talk about it with no repercussions. And then uh, it's like the media is almost more friendly to the topic. I have um, people contact me often to do. Uh, little sound bites for their documentaries and things. It's like, wow, people are intensely curious about it. They're not throwing it away like they once were. Right. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I was throwing a lot of, a lot of people your way. Cause a lot of people are asking me, it's like, do you have a, do you know anyone that has to do with the mad Mike? I go, well, I know the guy who's, who's directly in touch with him. And so I would shoot him whatever contact info I had, I think at the time, but uh, yeah. Ed, did you follow the launch on vice or the, um, attempted launch. Well, yeah. You mean the one where he, he got in the rocket, then got out and did his little speech. Yeah. They, were, they were trying to talk him into it. Oh, yeah. That's when I said, and I don't, you know, hopefully I don't ruffle any feathers on your side by saying this. I'm going, look, 
if you were planning on donating any more money to this guy, you might not want to at this point because he's bailed on on everything. And and I could just tell from his body language, he was like he had no intention. He was totally gone. And and the people were sitting there going, oh, what can we do to fix? No, nah, no, nah, I gotta do stuff. I you know I gotta sue the governor tomorrow or whatever. It's like I'd get. He's like, I gotta go. I gotta go. I got some cores in the in the van, and then I'm gonna go sue. Uh... Charles Manson's estate and get yeah. some cards worth a million yeah. bucks. Yeah, it's like, come on, man, you're killing us. But at the same time, that he had two waves. The first wave was bigger than the second one. Two waves of huge amounts of press. Huge. I, right. I, I, best money ever spent. Yeah, I think so. I think it was one. Of, uh, as far as bang for your buck billboards go, absolutely. I mean, I heard. I think it was Hustler. They were interviewing you, and they brought up Mad Mike, and I'm like, man, he is. That story resonated, and it's because it's a story. Well, you know what it resonated. You know what it was. It was. Uh, it was, and I love simplifying things. When when you can boil it down, media loves, especially nowadays, if you can boil it down to a really really quick soundbite or or title. That's when it really resonates. And the initial, I remember that day, you know, the, the original titles of, you know, people were, the different articles were out there and, and the wording wasn't that great. And then some guy uh, put the two together and it was like flat earth, rocket launch, mad mic, you know, it's like that was, that was the big thing, you know, this they were tying they were tying the, the the words together but it was a really really short sentence and media loves stealing from each other and so they were stealing that line over and over and over again to where I, that's all i was seeing it was just waves and waves of this yeah. and uh, and most of the stories are reporting on other stories like a lot right. of it wasn't even going to the source and that's how the misconceptions were spread and people were saying look what you've done now they're saying that this guy's trying to prove the earth is flat with this steam powered rocket and i'm like course. Let yeah. the misconceptions go out there, yeah. because then the second wave will be when they correct it. Exactly. Oh yeah, let them talk. Oh, yeah. let let them talk. Every, I mean, the the any publicity is good publicity. That is not as an old old saying, and there's a reason for it. We, which is as long as it, there's, it's you know, um, per, uh, Steven Spielberg would say this: a production value, which is look, you didn't have to do anything. Look what he did. He just set up a rocket in the desert and drank beer. And the media flocked to him, and it was like a, it was a story in just about every newspaper in the world, at one exactly. at, at one point. For for what he was just sitting there, literally doing nothing, and he ended up doing nothing. <laughs> well, well, oh, I had people saying this is all just a publicity stunt. I'm like, well, he's a stunt man, yeah. and a huge part of a stunt man is publicity. It's and hype. I think it comes from an era. It, it is hype, and yeah. it's before you had stuntmen been doing their thing since before we had internet, and so you had to have word of mouth, you had to have witnesses to the miracle, to the event, and whatever his intentions are, um, I, we got our money's worth. Oh, absolutely, no got the money's worth. No, it's best best seven grand or whatever you ever could have spent. You couldn't have you couldn't have generated that many headlines. I mean, it was pennies on the dollar for for, exactly. for what you got yeah. out of it. Now, eventually, yes. Like, uh, here's the difference between he and, let's say, Evil Knievel from back in the day. Of course, it was a whole different set of media back then. But the difference was that eventually, and Evil Knievel was big on hype, too. The Snake River Jump, he hyped the hell out of that thing. But eventually, he had to get in the rocket and jump. You know, eventually, you got to get in the motorcycle and floor it. You know, and, and eventually, eventually go to the hospital and hope you don't die. Right, right, right. Uh, but but Mad Mike yeah. was like, you know what? I'm just gonna you know, keep keep putting these guys through the hoops and seeing how long he can do it. Now, does he come? You know, does he do this months from now and try it again? Who knows? Uh, if he does, I mean, to me, it's like crying wolf. It's like, all right, um, I, I I think the hype is gone. I mean, the the momentum's gone. Right. Like, yeah. Even if he does it, I'm not as interested in it anymore. I'm like, okay, well, I wasn't really happy with the explanation. But regardless, we're whatever, what whatever, so it, it, past, it, it did, it did what it, it did more than what I thought it was going to do. He, well, here's the thing I'll ask you is, do you think, okay, see, um, Elon Musk had some failed rocket launch, quote unquote, failed, you know, a week before. Oh, you had, and to, then, had um, to bring up Elon they, Musk. They, really. well, well, they called <laughs> Mad Mike Rocket Man. They called oh, him right. Rocket Man. And then Musk, that's the name of his, of his biography. And so I was like, wait a minute. It looks like somebody's a little miffed here because on the 23rd, during the Christmas holiday, Elon Musk had that big publicity stunt. Right. And I suggested that maybe he was just trying to one-up Mad Mike because then suddenly he's out there in the media posing with one of his rockets, and they're calling him Rocket Man. So I'm like, it's almost like there's a back and forth because Mike had actually said that Musk fakes his rockets with blimps or CGI. 
Right. And you would have thought that that Elon Musk wouldn't, I mean, he'd get man's worth billions of dollars. Why would he care what, what Mad Mike's doing? But at the same time, headlines are headlines. And for whatever reason, Elon, well, I know why. I mean, any anybody that generates, once you reach a certain net worth, whatever you say is a potential headline. And Elon is, oh God, he's so horrible at making, he just, he, he, I, you probably may or may not have heard me say this. Like, look, you could take a whole room full of futurists and get them drunk, just get them blind drunk. And they still wouldn't make the predictions that Elon does, you know, make these claims. Yeah, right. Like, I'm going to solve Puerto Rico's power problem. I'm going to send two tourists around the moon. We're going to colonize Mars by 20 30 hey how about this super jet i'm gonna build it's gonna go to china and back in an hour and it's gonna cost less than a first class ticket it's like where are you coming up with this stuff is well the contradiction the the comparison for me the juxtaposition of mad mike and elon musk was that mike made a garage out i mean made a rocket out of his garage mm -hmm. and musk sells computer models of things he might possibly be able to have produced by other people right. so i was like I don't even think Elon Musk could use a real wrench. He's all in the virtual reality, whereas Mad Mike represents somebody nuts and bolts kind of guy. Yeah. But with with this Musk thing, you know, he's I, I listen to him speak, and it, to me it's gibberish. And then I look at the comments, and the comments are all probably shills. They're like, oh no, the reason why he sounds like that is that he's so smart, his mouth can't keep up. So no Whatever. No, 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 no. He is he's, not an engineer. I looked him up. I did some homework on him. Look, he's got a bachelor's in physics. And he helped build PayPal. He was an 11, I believe you believe the stories, he was an 11% shareholder when PayPal went through the roof, when it when it became like the thing to buy. And, you know, and you're thinking, well, 11% is not that much. No, it is, you know, when we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. And so, yeah, he's nothing. I mean, he's, he, he, when you hear him speak, you're, you're talking to, yeah, he, he does a little bit with software from what I can tell. Other than that, you know, yeah, I don't think he's ever turned a wrench in his life. Uh, it's it, funny, though, because it's like he, he's like his fans are like, well, no, what he's doing is he's speaking up there and he's so smart. He sounds dumb. And then when it comes to his rocket, like most recently Falcon Heavy, it's so real. It looks fake. Oh, it's like, that, OK, at some point, somebody's going to have to say, hey, that emperor has no clothes. Yeah. Yeah. His no, it's not that he sounds dumb. He is dumb, especially when it comes to the media. He was saying things. I mean, that the quote that he said somewhere around that line where you're saying uh, it, you know, it's you know that it's real because it looks so fake, where he also said tripping. I'm tripping balls right now. I have never heard a person in a position of power ever use that phrase in my life. Ever, ever, ever. And this is a guy that because people forget their history, that, that you could go to the, you know, the average person on the street and say, yeah, who, who invented Tesla? Oh, it was Elon Musk. No, 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 no. He didn't invent Tesla. He just bought Tesla with his PayPal money. You know, it's like it's like uh, Mark Cuban saying that he invented the Dallas Mavericks. No, he just bought the Dallas Mavericks. Right. There's nothing, right, to, right. There's nothing to do with that. No, Elon Musk is just a, oh, he's horrible, horrible, horrible. Awful. Now, um, I have a another kind of a side topic that we're steering into here with Elon Musk, which is basically the the putting the star man in space, right? Or quote in space. Um, do you think that that is maybe I don't know a nail in the coffin as far as the debate, or do you think that I mean, do you think it debunks itself, or is that just my bias? It that was bias? no, no, no. It's it's not a bias. Um, I think it was. I think it had multiple levels to it. I think for, first and foremost, it was a real time test social media test to see <laughs> no, I, I don't want to be crude here how much the general population is willing to swallow meaning right you, you put that up there <laughs> and, and and honestly the production value could, wasn't that terrible until they got to the car and then the whole thing just fell apart because it was it was too it was too good. Kind of like what you're saying, you know, the color palette. Even Elon Musk was having a hard time explaining why it looks so cheesy. Uh, where where they where they went wrong, or again, or went right, depending on who you're talking to, was that when the links were sent to because it wasn't like it was national news and people were anticipating the launch. It was like it was just spread around really fast once it once everything started happening. And when, like, like for example, when I got the shortcut that that showed the little picture, saying, "Oh yeah, you know," I when I saw the picture of that that profile shot of the man, the astronaut mannequin with the car and the Earth in the background, I first first impression, 
even without the flat earth was, oh yeah, somebody from the community sent me a cool little meme of a car in space, blah, 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 right? And only when I clicked, so I immediately didn't believe it. And then when I clicked on it and it went to mainstream news, I was going, wait, this is, this is being passed, this is passed off. This is actually being broadcast on mainstream right now. Uh, then it's like, okay, then you have to kind of try to get back. You know, you have to convince yourself that it's real. And we saw that from a lot of people that weren't in flat earth. They, it was tough. I mean, that for, I, there yeah. was a, a Fox news guy that was saying is like, yeah, it looks fake. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it does look fake. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. It was, I, I have this point where I'm like, Hey, listen, if somebody's not willing to at least recognize that it looks fake, even if they believe it's real then don't debate them on flat earth because they're not objective at that point. Right. Because even if you believe it's real, you have to admit it looks fake. Oh God. Yes. AF. It, it was, you know, I will say this though, as much as they screwed up the whole car thing, you know, cause Elon said it was a normal car and you know, normal cars aren't equipped for any sort of vacuum, high temperature environment. I'm sorry, high temperature and low temperature environment. Uh, aside from that and the booster rocket issue, it was the finest example of misdirection I've ever seen, which was, what they did, it was that this part was brilliant. The only part I will give them a compliment for, which was so this this rocket goes up, right, and has three boosters. The three boosters drop off. They have two landing supposedly at Kennedy, right next to each other, and then another one landing on that barge, which apparently was out in the Bermuda Triangle. And they were going, and you can see, like you know, if you've ever been in a, in a production studio type thing, you've got a product, you know, producer, you know, he's mon he's he's show doing the camera things. He's he's going, okay, camera one, camera two, okay, boosters one and two down, and the booster in the water, and car, and that's how it went. Where all of a sudden it was like, okay, the boosters are down. Instantly went to profile shot of car with astronaut in front of Earth, the iconic picture. The problem when they did that, and this is where the misdirection comes in, the problem when they did that was they completely left out, and everybody missed it, where, how the car got there. Meaning, you remember, you had three boosters, and you had the main Falcon Heavy rocket. And then the capsule that opens up, you know, that splits down the middle, and then that big giant rocket that got the car up there, that ends up tumbling back. And because they never showed it, it never happened. That was bro that was brilliant. Where it was like, okay, the boosters went down, and because people don't you know, don't know their how rockets are laid out, that should have been the shot. That should have been the money shot where you literally have the, the car at the front I'm sorry, the camera at the front of the car that's facing the astronaut. You would have seen the thing split open, you would have seen the big booster tumbling back, but you can't do that if you're on a budget because that's a whole nother layer of special effects that you have to deal with. Because as they did it, they only had to deal with two layers, which was the car layer and then the earth layer. There was nothing transitioning between one and the other, which is what you would have to do with uh, the giant falcon heavy that part was good the the rest of it though utter crap <laughs> utter terrible very good i i appreciate your analysis on that you're right what a misdirection it was like we didn't notice that it just magically appeared yeah because we were focused on the uh spectrum and that's what they do though yeah. you know i think the rockets the pageantry the smoke I oh, think it's all not to mention the not to mention the crowd coaching I've never heard i've uh, the crowd that was down at the you know the spacex headquarters was way too loud uh, look if you've ever been in a studio audience you know they have crowd coaching you know they have someone there to you know to, if if they can't get laughter they'll pipe in the laughter but they'll you know they'll they'll have a guy that's coaxing the audience say okay all right you know a lot of applause for this guest and you know boo for this and yay for this and laugh at this and the crowd at spacex that main auditorium was way too loud i mean you you would have thought you were the uh, final four basketball tournament with the way these guys were yelling. It's like, wait a minute, why are you yelling so much for this thing? There's not even a person on this rocket. Why the hell would you even? In fact, why are you even there? It's not even a yeah, man. It's, it's a, not even a manned mission. What are you doing? Yeah, it, isn't it very conspicuous just how overzealous they are? And to me, it, it does sound like zealotry. It sounds like a cult. And most people who I, I show this to or we watch it, like when you watch even NASA, whenever they launch something, the way the people in the studios all jump around, and I think it's life follows art. You know, in the movies, it's yeah. always a big buildup. Right. You're, there's tension, and then they survive. They land on the asteroid, and they save the planet or something, and everybody jumps and cheers, and there's tears everywhere, right. like in Armageddon. And I think they're trying to recreate that scene from Armageddon. There you go. Every launch. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good.
Yeah, yeah war and and the Armageddon that hails back to the original Apollo missions where there was cheering, you know, cheering groups of people. But they overhype it and we do this now. Uh we do this in um uh by the way, there's a little feedback on your side. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. We do this in sports stadiums now, and you're not supposed to. It's illegal. And there have been several NFL teams that have gotten nailed for it because you you just pipe in crowd noise in addition to your crowd noise, you know, to make it louder when the other when the other team's trying to snap the ball and stuff. And so we we've been doing this for years. And so piping in, I I when I first heard the crowd noise, I was going, "Where they got like." 2,000 people there. When I'm looking, I'm going, what is that, a couple hundred? It's going, okay. So they're augmenting the crowd noise on top of it. I'm pretty good at the audio stuff. and there's, it, it, But that was minor compared to the rest of the crowd. I'm sorry, that, that car would have self-destructed if it, if it was really in a vacuum in space. The, the tires would have detonated. All the pressure, any pressurized fluid, the window washer fluid, the battery acid fluid. If the thing had shocks, they would have blown up. It didn't have gas, but who cares? The transmission fluid might have had problems. The, the safety glass would have shattered. The the glass in the windows, which were rolled down, those would have broken in two seconds. Uh, there would have been glass flying everywhere. It's just, oh my God, it was... But, but the, the general population, it helped us in the end because the secondary headlines, in fact, I was called uh, by a group in London almost immediately. He goes, hey, what's your take on the... Uh, SpaceX thing, and I gave him a you know a laundry list of the stuff I just rattled off to you. Uh, not to mention the the part you know follow the money, the part that really bugged me, and you'll appreciate this only because you had to do the logo thing with Mad Mike, which was you had three cameras on that car, not a single logo in any of the frames from anywhere. You know, two companies, SpaceX and Tesla. Tesla is a public company, you know, and they're hurting right now. Go figure, trying to sell car electric cars to the rich. SpaceX, you, you want to get funding for that. Why isn't your logo on the side of that car? In fact, why are, these, are there no corporate endorsements at all? Disney alone, who owns Star Wars at this point, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. Disney would have re, could have replaced that mannequin with a stormtrooper in two seconds, would have paid the extra money to not have any other, other seats in the car filled. And you, you, you could have sold a, a, any number of, of corporate logos and it would have been cheap to do. It's like, well, what if the, the blue, what if the rocket blew up? Who cares? Just put, you know, get another one, put a sticker on. Good, you know, good point. You know what? When it comes to anything that they show us, the space programs, private or public, right. I have a rule. I call it the, uh, the law, the law of conspicuous absence. So it's not in what they show you that you're going to find. Yeah. inconsistencies or you're going to find the deception it's what is inconspicuously or what is um yeah what's missing out, what is yeah. conspicuously absent so, yeah 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 obviously. oh yeah that's 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 the max malone line where he he was the the first one to t teach me that where he he, he said look for the things that aren't there forget about the things what you see what don't you see and you yeah and, exactly and i was really surprised i'm going okay so why did spacex leave all their logos off unless maybe they weren't even sure how the public would react to it and they were trying to they were doing like uh proactive damage control where it's like okay well if our logos aren't on it they won't be able to create memes on it right away and our company won't be tied to it right away i mean look tesla's in real trouble stock wise this thing should have boosted it not only that you would have gotten here, here's another one for you and and this is there's some weird conversations probably happening in the background now where if let's say you're a, another car company like gm or chevy or ford or what you know whoever it is like one of the truck companies i mean immediately anyone from the marketing departments for those companies let's say ram trucks would have called up tesla in two seconds and said look whatever your next rocket is we want our truck in there instead of that tesla we will pay you gobs of cash to do it and you know what do you do but you can't accept that offer because you would you know for the same reason why you can't have any corporate offers because that would allow them into the facility you can't have them monkeying around underneath the hood of this thing because it isn't fine real. The, the fourth wall, like yeah, the, the fourth wall. There's no rear view mirror on the car. Where's the mirror? For yeah, the where's the rear view mirror on the car? That was brilliant. I missed okay. that one too. I missed that one for a week. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's what I mean. It's not what they show you when they're liars. You right. know, it's always in what is conspicuously absent, and it's like we didn't know to look for it. I mean, so the whole thing to me has been very educational about magic, and then reverse engineering, reverse engineering our own. Um, you know, when we suspend disbelief, we accept certain things and so i think this whole exercise or thought experiment or whatever it is whenever you look into these topics it helps you see how you can be deceived and that's the tough thing right like uh twain said you know it's easier to deceive a man than convince him he's been deceived exactly so um exactly. 
do you have any uh, predictions for the ISS now? Because this, it seems to me that the consumer level CGI um, and ed editing capabilities are so fastly evolving. Like it's rapidly getting better every year. And the ISS, if they suddenly improve their game and they suddenly look like Sandra Bullock in Gravity, it's going to be conspicuous that they went from being kind of like B-movie government propaganda film to flying around in the thing convincingly. I'm, so, I, I don't think they'll ever truly get to that point, and here's why. Because NASA is notorious. They've got a massive track record for trying to do things live. Always have, always will. Uh, mostly because, remember, uh, NASA is this educational, friendly group that loves talking to college students. Or, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not just college students, grade school kids, high school kids. They do that all the time. It's like, let's call the space station. And, you know, the kid's like, what's it like being in space? And they've got to answer them live, right? You've got a news person there. And the, when you do anything live, and, and there's a reason why 99% of our media that's out there is not live, is there are always mistakes that are made. Whether not just the actors screwing up their lines, but in the production value. And in fact, most of the mistakes we have seen, doesn't matter the tech they've got or, or, or not, you're bound to make, it's, it all comes down to the weakest link. You know, the, the weakest link in the chain, it's always somebody that will screw it up. Doesn't matter. Uh, let, let's go back to an old operation. Doesn't matter how how elaborate the operation is. It come, the weakest link can completely throw the whole thing into disarray because of the flaws. Uh, take, not, not to go off on a quick tangent, but I got to mention this. Take Sandy Hook, for example, right? Months and months in the planning almost completely brought down because Robbie Parker missed his camera cue. And, you know, was smiling and didn't know the camera was live. And then, yeah. you know, gets up to the podium, you know, gets into character. And, you know, this is CNN. This is a CNN feed. And it's like, holy crap, what is he doing? And that, you know, that's that's just one link. That one incident through the whole thing, you know, into in, even from even your skeptics have a hard time with that one. The ISS, same yeah. sort of thing. And that is if they're talking to school kids and the timing's off or the CGI glitches or whatever it is, it's just the, the tech because and I remember I come from the tech world because we're always pushing the envelope of what we can do. It's never bulletproof. Never, ever, ever, ever is it bulletproof because you're always trying to improve things. There's always every piece of software you're using always has bugs in right. it. You never, in fact, it's 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 kind of like the curse of software developers, where you're all, where you never get to the point where it's like it's absolutely 100 percent bulletproof. Let's stop fiddling with it. No, that's that's the opposite of what software people do. It's like, well, let's tack on this, let's tack on this, and then you run into problems, like the like they did with the Mike Helmick video where the guy grabs the, the hat, he thinks he grabs the hat, and then all of a sudden he realizes he didn't grab it, you know, because it, right, exactly. it wasn't there. So. And, and, and then with Sandy Hook, even if the tech's all there and everybody's on point, that was just a human error. You yeah, know, that was that was a human error, even if you could get past all the other crap and or or little things. Sorry, let me let me do another Sandy Hook thing for you. Cause I've been on I've been revisiting that one lately anyway, where uh, the uh, they announced it too soon and the traffic copters Remember, they, they didn't anticipate how quickly traffic copters could get there because they don't have to go through traffic. So, you know, traffic helicopter can get there in 10 minutes. It's like, blah, 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 blah. and they have a full tank of gas because they're a traffic copter. You know, all they do is hover around the air all day. And they, they, every once in a while, they refuel. So they're sitting there above the school, sitting there, and no, none of the kids come out. And to where Max Malone, got to give him credit here, where he goes, look, I'll give $1,000 if you can show me a single freaking video of a law enforcement officer carrying a kid out of that building. Because they don't exist. They, you, know, you know how long it would take to get 600 kids, grade school kids, out of a building? It'd take hours. And, they, and, right. they, and they, so they announced it too quickly. And so by the time the helicopters got there, you know, and they're saying, oh, yeah, it's still on lockdown. Still on lockdown. You're waiting. You're waiting. The copters are shooting footage. Nobody's doing anything. Nobody's running around. They're just having cigarettes. It's like, w did we miss it? When, when, when did this happen exactly? And then that was it. And then, then the new media just ran with it. And that was, that was the end, but oh my God. It was... well, well, I had personally been pretty much burned out on conspiracies for a couple of years before Sandy Hook. And the only reason I even looked into it and gave it a second look at all was Robbie Parker's smile. I just assumed oh. that maybe somebody had hired or they had a patsy do something bad to advance a political agenda. Then I, that it was a smile. Then I, then I came to the phenomenon of crisis actors right. and it's interesting how 
right now the media is struggling to bury that term where they're saying if you put crisis actor in the headline of a YouTube video, banned. If anything relating to crisis acting trends in Google, they're going to take it down. Uh, Periscope, if you put crisis actor in the title, like there was Vox Populi, a very popular blogger in the gaming world. He was talking about his his time as a crisis actor, working with some EMTs as a volunteer. Right, I and read he that said article. His live stream, yeah, his live stream was interrupted. So I'm like, whoa, they're trying to censor it. This is the Barbara Streisand yeah. effect. He said and, it's going to result, and I think it's happening. And well, it will to a certain to a ter- certain extent, but it's not going to be again not going to be perfect. But don't forget why the whole crisis actor damage cr- control thing happened. It was because somebody and I don't know who did it uh, released David Hogg's outtakes. Where you know Dave, th- that got a lot of traction. Where all of a sudden you sitting there, it wasn't like a like a two second clip or a three second clip. He was fumbling trying to go through his rehearsed lines, and you're going, "Oh, it's his outtakes." It's like, wait, why does he have outtakes? This is supposed to be a live broadcast, <laughs> and, right. and and every actor knows this. I mean, the entertainment community, I'm sure, was looking at this because every entertainer goes through this. If you're if you're doing lines, it's like. Yeah, is I do this, you know, actors do that every day. It's so the question is, why is this kid doing it? And but and um the the part that I kind of liked from this was because they were doing damage control on him. I mean, they they realized, yeah, he the problem was he yeah, he was totally camera ready and he was put on all these different cameras, right? And the media loved him for a, for a very short amount of time. The problem was because they all loved him, they were all hanging on him. So when that outtake thing came out, they had to backpedal from him pretty quick. So when CNN did that town hall meeting, you notice who wasn't up on stage with with yep. uh, Rubio and the others? He wasn't. And he was there, too. He was in the audience. In fact, they one of the cameras panned to him. He was just kind of off in the middle of the group. He should have been there front and center on the, in that stage, and he wasn't. Because they were going, okay, we can't give this kid any more, any more light right. because of what happened. And so, yeah, the... the well- Go ahead. No, well, with this whole event, though, between you know Starman and now this latest thing, Stone Man, I'm like, hey, look, this is a new litmus test. This is how you can tell um, how much faith somebody has in the media. Do you believe right. Starman's real? Do you believe that this event happened as portrayed? Because it mirrors so many other events. It almost looked like the same script writer from Sandy Hook, and they threw in a little bit of Littleton and a little bit of Dylan Roof in there and Presto, right. another event. And so to me, this is a good time to ask people, hey um, – have we placed too much faith in the media? And if we haven't, then why are they making such a big deal about this crisis actor meme getting out there? Right. Well, it, yeah. And again, the media, it kind of was, they were hurting themselves because the media likes to see what's trending and what's not. And so when all of a sudden the top YouTube trending video is a crisis, a crisis actor video, and one of our guys got on it, uh, he was like the second second choice. So MGTV, if you remember, he he got on it and he was getting hundreds of thousands of hits, and and his was taken down. But he got it. He was like second generation, so he got it from the guy that that was uh, he was MGTV was the, one of the first people to mirror it from that guy who was the one that was trending all over mainstream. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I actually accused him. I said, hey man, um, it's pretty bad that you got to buy this many views because um, his his channel's getting views a couple hundred hits each, and then suddenly I'm like, whoa, he's getting ten thousand hits every five minutes on this video and right. it went from zero to a quarter of a million in a matter of hours. And then I saw, okay, this particular clip of David Hogg's outtakes is just blowing up. Right. Again, because they understand it, the media, more than anything, the media understands entertainment and it's, look, it's not just actors, reporters have to do that all the time. And reporters have to stop and start again, you know, look up on YouTube reporters outtakes, you know, they have to rehearse stuff all the time. And yeah, he was a he was a, uh, a student journalist, sure. And that California thing didn't do him any favors as well. I mean, yeah, you could have said, okay, fine. He was out in California the the previous summer. The question is, why was he out there exactly doing his thing? And you know, coincidence. It didn't help him. It didn't necessarily completely damn him, but it but it didn't help him either. Uh, right. But, but as far as yeah, as far as the mainstream media, do we believe it? Yeah, of course, because we're t- we're told that it's real. You know, the, the mainstream media, it's like, we're legit. We're legit. We would never, we would never steer you wrong. And oh, okay. the, people forget that the media is no different from any other organization in, on this world. We, you know, take, take your pick. Business, politics, entertainment, uh, uh, sports, right? 
all these groups, there's always corruption. There's always, you know, money influences everything. And don't tell me, oh, okay, l l l here, let me go down the other way. I was watching CNN quite a bit during that whole, uh, it was Parkland, right? Or no, free, yes. free Parkland, where the NRA person was getting grilled on CNN, not the town meeting, where where she was saying that, look, you know, she was she was saying, look, it, it's ratings gold. It, it's all about. And the, the woman from CNN's going, well, you can't say we'd root to, to have children killed. Right. And I'm and, and I'm I'm responding to the screen, even though she can't hear me. And I'm going, no, you wouldn't root specifically to have children killed. You'd root for any disaster to show up. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a train crash or a plane or a boat sinking, you know, the media, you know, the, the saying, it, if it bleeds, it leads. That's a journalist saying, and it's absolutely 100% true. It, and so the question is, can the media be influenced for money? Of course they can. They, they have been for, if you have any doubt of that, look up the, the old movie, one of the finest mo movies in the history of cinema, Citizen Kane. Which is, you know, when, when, when rich people figured out the old, the old saying, it's like, okay, if rich people person is getting bashed by a particular n newspaper, what's the solution to that? You buy the newspaper and then you can write any story about you you want. And, you know, then all the newspapers were bought, then all the radio stations and all the television stations. Sure. Uh, it was uh, Randolph Hearst who said, you supply the pictures, I'll supply the war. Exactly. When media was when when media became mass media, it was never about let's inform everybody, make sure everybody has all the good information. It's always been just an outlet for the powerful and you know a proxy for governmental influences and everything else. Exactly. I call it the game program, the game, government, academia, media, entertainment. Right. I don't think that we should look at them as separate entities anymore. No, 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 no. I, in fact, the George Carlin, uh, the late George Carlin, I should say, he, he one of his number one quotes was. When it comes to uh, the, the, the government or the media, he goes, never believe, he goes, and he said, never believe anything that you hear uh, that you hear in the media when it comes to, you know, government release stuff. But he was really talking about the media in general, where he's saying that it's, it's too corrupt at this point. There, every story has its motives. There's a reason why these stories are out there. With the yeah, of course, there is an occasional fluff piece from time to time. Oh well, hell, what was the um? Oh, the perfect example would be, and you're not even allowed to to, to reproduce these things on YouTube anymore. Um, do you remember when Conan O'Brien, his team figured out that all the local news affiliates were were running the same stories and reading the the teleprompter the exact same way? Did you ever? Yeah, the montages. Yeah, the yeah, montages. He he stole that from Rush Limbaugh, who was doing it for years. But, oh, okay. Well, yeah. well, perfect. The um, well, what? But the thing was, uh, Conan's team. Anyone in a network in a situation has access to all the affiliates' footage, and so and they can do it without any royalty issues. So when they were okay. collecting them, they were doing it fairly innocently. It's like, well, you know, and he thought, oh, isn't that kind of funny? But from a conspiracy standpoint, that's not funny at all. That means that the local news, that most of their stories aren't just generated from, you know, they read what's coming off the AP and they read it verbatim. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's. Repeaters, not reporters. And my, um. My lately, my theme, or as far as like the direction I've been going with this conversation regarding flat Earth, is that you can no longer really talk about the Earth being flat without talking about who's informing us, which is the media, and then what the media is. So it's a bigger conversation, and it's not that we have to replace our pundits with more honest ones. I think the institution of media itself needs to be, um, our relationship needs to be redefined as far as how we approach getting our information. Right. So I've been banding around this term post media. Mm. It's kind of analogous to post-globe, but post-media, meaning we are in a post-media age. We're just watching the death throes of these big networks. Right. And I'm like, I think that those of us who have questioned these big questions, you know, not just Flat Earth, but everything leading up to it, even whether or not the news is real, um, I think we're already post-media. And so we're looking at the media a little more objectively, being like, look what they're selling. It's absurd. Yeah, the, the network yeah, news the network. feeds have been, have been diminishing, uh, kind of like uh, the... Um, if you're old enough to remember the Lawrence Welk show, the Lawrence Welk show went on for years and years and years and years. And the only reason it stopped was because the average age of the, the, the audience got to the point where there were people were, they were dying. 
and they're, you know, so their audience was just shrinking because of, of natural causes. That's what's been happening with the media now for some time, but for a different reason. And that's because, and in fact, I just did a video on this just recently called The Blurring Effect, whereas media has gotten so broad, there's so many different avenues where you can get your news that your, uh, you know, your normal channels, I mean, what used to be the staple, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and, and you know, PBS and CNN sometimes, they are now the minority. And they, they know it. They're dying. They, they don't know what to do. I mean, YouTube has become the new television or one of the new televisions. I mean, Netflix, most people don't know that, that Netflix is one of the biggest Hollywood producers now because they've got so much liquid cash from because they buried Blockbuster and they've got all this streaming stuff that they figured, oh, we get, we're, we get spend, spend our money. So they've been the one financing movies. Everything's changing at such a rapid rate that media is, is holding on to what it can. I mean, it's still out there, of course, but it's not its not what it used to be. I mean, like when Fox came, no, who, who, who would have thought when Fox, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I've been calling this a new reformation. I'm saying it's like, it looks to me like the movable type press that enabled people to critically examine what the priesthood was telling them, which allowed them to break away from its, uh, uh, its one interpretation of reality was, you know, the movable type press. And to me, that's YouTube. That's chat rooms. That's live streaming. That's all these, uh, you know, even Skype would be included in this. Anything that allows us to analyze information outside of their filtration, right, and get a totally alternative view, and so, and um, and, yeah, it, and it's non-retractable. That's the part I love about the internet now. There's a line that's a that I quote too many Batman movies, where where it said everything on the everything on the internet sticks now. And that is, yeah, you can try to pull it off. You know, like you're saying, all oh, crisis actors, they're going to try and knock, you know, knock all those out. Yeah, maybe, but it, they're not going to be able to knock out all the rest of them. For example, you know, like anyone that uses the word hoax, there's tons and tons of those. It would take, even with an uh, advanced algorithm, it was going to take a long, long time. And if you kill off, here's the, here's the bad thing. If you kill off enough videos or enough people or the wrong people that say crisis actors, then you're just raising flags. And then people start, it's like, look, dude, I just made it. You, you want to see something weird, especially if it's repeatable. But, you know, I just, I put up a crisis actor video, uh, you know, title, and it, it just knocked, you know, knocked my channel off. You know, people will take notice to that. And it's like, okay, what's yeah. going on? Vox Populi brought that up. He said, hey, use this as an opportunity to red pill your blue pill friends. Say, hey, you may not take anything I say seriously, but make a video called Crisis Actor Hoax and just throw it up there and your account will be taken down. And yeah, so there is overt censorship we're looking at. And I think YouTube's shooting themselves in the foot because there's a lot of great content that's going to be um, migrating now. I mean, I think Jaron just had his live streaming capabilities taken down because of a video months ago where he was just asking questions about San Bernardino. I have another friend who had a Sandy Hook video from three years ago that nobody's watched, and they used that to pull his account just yesterday. Yeah, unfortunately, when it well, okay, when it comes to the shootings, there there has been they have gotten a lot stronger, and yeah, if Jaron, if that's true, that Jaron got his live stream smacked because that means he's got two strikes. The um, that's and hopefully he, he'll get rid of the other ones uh, in the meantime, just because you don't want some guy because there's doesn't seem to be a statute of limitations, you know, where it's like three, three years. Exactly. I mean, that three that video was so that far back that I'm sure Jaron forgot it was sure. there. So exactly. And that, that's the point. I'm, and I'm thinking it's almost as though they're trying desperately to to just go through the the history and remove stuff. I mean, I had a pretty good website built to the Charleston shooting hoax. Is what I called it, and all of my content's gone because it was based on other people's YouTube videos of right. suspected crisis actors, uh, and so, and it was frustrating. So now I'm like looking at this. It's like, okay, so let's go ahead and start from Eric Holder, 1996, saying we need to brainwash the kids not to want guns anymore, and then look at every single shooting since then in detail and put it up on the blockchain where it can't be deleted, and so we can objectively analyze it. And I'm happy to be wrong about anything from a shooting to the shape of the earth, but you know I want facts. Yeah. No, I'm not going to take anybody's word for it. I was just uh, I was just doing a quick search up for crisis actors on YouTube, and there's still a, you know quite a few out there, but not not as much as there used to be. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very it's an interesting topic, and um, it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves over the rest of the year. Um, so we've been on for about an hour. I appreciate your time. Um, yeah. Is it still enclosedworld.com? Is that still your main site where people interface with you? Where yeah, they can, uh, yeah. Enclo you? Enclosedworld.com, although most of the stuff on there are just links back to YouTube. 
and I've been pretty careful about, you know, making sure that I have no strikes on my on my thing at any given time. I have, by the way, received four strikes on that channel on my on my main YouTube. Well, I only have one YouTube channel, but it's all been for uh, copyright things and all of them oh, been... like like soft strikes. You mean like you're using they just notify you? No, no. Oh God, no! I get notifications all the time. <laughs> I, mean, I get okay, notifications figure. probably every other video I make because I use copyrighted music all the time. And you can, by the way, for people that are out there doing this, you can use copy. You're never going to get a copyright. Well, probably 99 percent chance. You're not going to get a copyright strike for using music. It's usually for video clips. And what I meant was like I use a seven minute clip when the trailer park boys were talking about Flat Earth and they, they struck me and I returned it and I said fair use. Um uh, George Nori and Coast to Coast. When I when I did the interview with them, I didn't put it up there, but they nailed me just for the trailer, and because they didn't even click, you know, the intern didn't even click on the video. It's like, dude, it's a trailer. You can't hit me for that. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, and then there was an Indian rapper who contacted me, but forgot to tell his producers that he wanted me to put his song on. And what was the last one? Oh, Buzzfeed. Go figure. Uh, I got I got hit for from Buzzfeed for using. A clip that they did, here's the irony, of me. So when BuzzFeed interviewed me down at the national conference, they uh, and I used their clip of them interviewing me, they copyright struck uh, me for me. It's like, you got to be kidding me. So I overturned that and, and just claimed fair use. Right, so. right. Yeah, well, I'm still, I'm, I'm following like Crow Triple Seven's business model. I'll use YouTube to reach out. I'll, I'll live stream there, but I'm keeping everything on my own site. You know, deep, everything's backed up um, just for the convenience. So, like, if someone's looking for you, there are so many videos, so many content creators that have your content. So, in closed world, will get them directly to your YouTube channel in particular. Exactly. Is Unless you, the easier ways is type in flat earth clues into Google. That, that's, that you can find me that way. Uh, yeah, the mirrors. Hell, I've gotten. That's the, the, the weird stuff about my 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 videos is. I'm more than yeah i think i've got 11 million hits on my channel but i've given away more than that from the mirrors because i make my stuff creative commons license and so there were people that that still it's the biggest the the videos with the most hits for flat earth are on channels that you'd never heard of and it's my videos but i have nothing to do with it i don't even know the guys who, who they are that's good marketing though i mean i call it ubiquity it's like it, you want to be able to be found anywhere, not yeah. just one place. Then you can't be. Then you can't really stamp it out. And right. so, yeah. yeah, it's achieved that. But okay, great. Um, so enclosedworld.com, and then I follow YouTube. I follow you, and it used to be Russian Vid. You know, I had two channels side by side that I kept. Right. If I want to know what's up with uh, Flat Earth up to date, it's Mark Sargent. If I want to know what's up with the world of psyops, it's Russian Vid. <laughs> so nice. You like my my unpaid research assistant? Oh, thank you. Anyway, thank you. I well, I do this twenty four seven. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. And hey, this is going to be up at flatearthnetwork.com. Uh, I'll um, I'll post. I'll email you when it's up. Okay. Do you want me? Do you, do you want me to put it up on my channel? Yeah. Exactly. What I'll do is I'll I'll send it to you as well, and then you can do a trailer or put it up in your channel in entirety, whatever you like. Okay. Awesome. All right, Mark. Well, we should do this again um, pretty soon. I just wanted to touch base. You know, we're starting 2018, and you know, like I said, I follow the news, Flat Earth Report. I follow the news every day, and I try to report on it. And so I wanted to get your take on things, especially since you've really been at the front here um, as an ambassador with all the big media networks. I mean, Piers Morgan talking to astronauts. It's been some pretty. Uh, it's been an interesting year. It's getting more interesting as we go along. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Twenty eighteen is going to be huge. Uh, there's a documentary coming out, a reality television show in the works, uh, lots of fun, fun things, and of course the Canadian conference coming out in August, and then the twenty eighteen conference in Denver in the fall. So it's gonna be fun. Excellent. All right. Well, stay in touch, and I'll talk to you later. Have All right. Nice thanks, day. man. Thanks, Ben. Mm -hmm. Bye.